Welcome to our first virtual debate among the candidates of the United States Transhumanist Party. We have Yohanan Ben Zion and Rachel Haywire, and soon to be joining us will be Charles Holsoppel. We are going to begin with candidate Yohanan Ben Zion. Excellent, excellent. Uh, so um, if you're not familiar uh, with my campaign, I am uh, uh, representing the Futurist New Deal, and I need to uh, uh, tell you a, a little bit about that. And now I have very long enjoyed the social criticism and very much the wit and wisdom of a gentleman uh, named Chris Hedges. Uh, he's known to some people as the American empire's prophet of doom. Now I feel it's good to pay attention to criticisms of all manner of systems, even if you don't look to every part of them as gospel truth. And that's the way that I've enjoyed Mr. Hedges. Um, so even though I am myself a uh, cockeyed techno-optimist, I admit sometimes uh, that uh, some not too many days will pass before I look at the news and I think, ooh, crikey, America is kind of boned. Um, that's what I want to uh, uh, talk to you about in the context of the Futurist New Deal. You need the Futurist New Deal more than you realize. Um, uh, speaking more broadly, there are a few affairs in the world uh, of humankind that could be said to uh, function absolutely perfectly. So many inst institutions will have a slapdash quality um, in the way that s the loveliest cities in the world are often ones that were built over periods of centuries rather than planned for or engineered. And of the institutions more broadly, the cultural, political, and all of them economic institutions, uh, we could look at them in a certain sense as works in progress rather than great engineering marvels. Uh, the United States perhaps over the years has gained a reputation for being a place where this is, is, is very true, even doubly so. Uh, so whereas the undertakings of other stable nation states uh, may generally be perceived as succeeding on their own merits, uh, the United States is perceived to be a place where, where things are sometimes dictated by oligarchic or imperialist forces. So the question I think we have to ask ourselves is, how do we make our systems less slapdash or, prob uh, or problematic? And that is where the Futurist New Deal uh, comes in. Um, a Futurist New Deal has a, f a number of points, uh, just, just like the charter documents of the Arizona Transhumanist Party and, um, and uh, the U.S. Transhumanist Party. Uh, there's, there's an awful lot of information uh, that we have. Uh, but um, I think we can boil it down uh, to a few key points. Uh, the, the Futurist New Deal uh, is a middle class basic income uh, funded by federal land leases. And we also advocate for full voter participation uh, through a federally mandated um, a blockchain voting system, a technology for which uh, it entirely exists. And I've talked about in a few of my podcasts, if you check out the Futurist New Deal podcasts on my page. And uh, also we are advocating for a number of other reforms, including um, uh, uni uh, uh, measures that would I implement universal health care. Now, if you disbelieve uh, that uh, the United States is such a place uh, plagued by these uh, problems, um, ask your friends uh, uh, what they think about the prospect of a civil war 2.0. Some of them be might believe this and whether they think that economic factors have anything to do uh, with this set of concerns or read one of the hundreds and hundreds of articles written uh, about anti-Americanism uh, in the larger world. Um, these uh, we 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 may want to look at these things in a positive light, but not everyone does agree on these things. I, I don't uh, like the way that the term deep state is used in, in the United States. It's bandied around and twisted. You're probably politically literate enough, literate enough to realize uh, that this refers to specifically centrally planned forms of government different from those in North America. But you would find it very difficult, I think, to dismiss uh, the term US deep state completely out of hand, um, just as you might have a hard time making a case to yourself or your friends uh, that the United States does not have these oligarchic or imperialist uh, uh, tendencies. Um, uh, the, the Futurist New Deal is, was intended and was, was conceived of as, a, as an attempt to, 
to uh, solve some of these problems. And also with uh, an issue that we'll, I'll be talking about in my next speech uh, with radical le life extension and, um, and uh, uh, super longevity in mind. It may on its, on its face uh, look like these things are not related, but we, uh, we, have, we have a unique opportunity here uh, to be moving our society in a direction uh, through a series of reforms that would allow everyone uh, to achieve a, a longer lifespan. And uh, we, need to, uh, we need to capitalize on these opportunities, uh, strengthen our middle class, uh, which has suffered in recent decades uh, because of uh, reform policies, which in hindsight uh, may be viewed as, um, as having harmed the middle class. We could say something like Reaganomics. Uh, so please consider the Futurist New Deal um, and, our, and, and this reform ticket as you are uh, making your decision to vote. Thank you. Uh, candidate Haywire, uh, please proceed with your introductory remarks. Hi, um, let me know, um, give me like a 10 second warning when my time is almost up. Very um, well. I like Ben Zion's Futurist New Deal. I'm interested in what he said about imperialism and oligarchy. Um, I think imperialism should be artistic. Um, I think the way to stop imperialism is to create an imperialist kind of mind simulation so we can explore our imperialistic tendencies through virtual reality and augmented reality. That way we can explore these areas of thought through art without actually hurting anybody through expanding visionary technology and funding the transgressive arts, we can explore these creative areas of self-expression through funding visionary tech. I think that this will stop these imperialistic tendencies that Ben Zion is referring to. That's one of the major things that I'm advocating for as a transhumanist candidate. Another thing that I'm advocating for is universal basic income. I believe that every American citizen should get $2,000 a month. The way that I want to do this is by cutting down our military budget. We're currently spending an obscene amount of money on overseas wars. I want to bring our troops home. I want to cut down on spending on the surveillance state. I fully agree with Tulsi Gabbard. I want to end this Cold War that we have with Russia right now. I think it's absurd. Our real threat is the Chinese surveillance state. Um, it's obscene, their, their social credit system, it's absolutely obscene. Um, as I said in my 4th of July speech, it's uh, enough to make any producer of Black Mirror jealous, the, the way that they're surveilling their citizens. Um, so I really wanna stop this imperialistic global trade. Um, so this, this is very important to me, to cut down on military spending, to cut down on the surveillance state, and really to get nonviolent drug offenders and sex workers out of prison. So we take that money and we relocate it to give every American citizen $2,000 a month, universal basic income, funding of the transgressive arts. And I believe that I would be a good candidate for president of the United States and for the transhumanist party for these reasons. Um, in addition to my experience as a transhumanist organizer, when I was a lot younger. In 2011, I founded the Extreme Futures Festival. It was one of the first events of its kind, if not the first event. I brought people together from all classes, people from the goth industrial scene, people from the punk subcultures, I'm with people from the high ends of the ivory towers and people from the Silicon Valley elite. Um, Aubrey de Grey was one of my headliners. I'm sure you guys are familiar with him. I brought him to speak with Ben Gertzel, who I'm sure you guys know. Um, he played alongside a uh, Tari Teenage Riot had Hanin Elias, who was one of the founders of the cyberpunk musical movement. We had people like the band Negative Land, an early cyberpunk pioneer. We had survival research laboratories, a performance art underground cult band in San Francisco. They created a pyrotechnics robotic show. We took over LA Center Studios. We had robots setting things on fire alongside life extension scientists, um, people talking about mind uploading. And I brought together all these different subcultural strata, all these different classes together to form kind of this new fusion of art and technology of life extension and self-expression. And to this day, there are many festivals that have still been influenced by the work that I've done. And I wanna continue on this pathway as a candidate. And this is all very important to me. Um, as Andrew Breitbart said, politics is downstream from culture. 
And I want to continue doing this work as a candidate. And I hope that you guys will support me in my efforts. Well, great, great. Thank you, Gennady and, and uh, Johan and Rachel for uh, being here and, and trying to put this together so we can change the world. And uh, myself, uh, uh, Charles Holsopel is my name, and I'm the founder of Project 222, a human rights campaign. And it, it basically says that we are all better off if each of us have dignified access within civil society to a minimum of two gallons of clean water a day, 2,000 nutritional calories a day, and 200 cubic feet of secure shelter. So covering Maslow's hierarchy of needs and putting it into finite amounts so that we can actually break it apart bit by bit scientifically, technology and ethics and our resources so that all people in the United States and ultimately around the world have dignified access to food, water, shelter. And I, I started that, uh, well, let me go back. And, and when I was a, a young child, I, I learned a couple what it has served me throughout my life. And they were uh, at the grocery store and, it, and out by the mailbox before I was in school. And I learned at the grocery store that there were two water fountains, one white. Curiously, my father told me there was no difference in the water. And this was the 1950s. And of course, that was segregation. So I learned that black and white are not always black and white. And absolute is, is a uh, perspective for the most part. And there's always that little quantum quirk somewhere. And in, in this case, it was obvious that society was not treating this, this as the same. And then I learned about heaven and hell. And out by the mailbox, I'm talking to little Jenny Berman. And she tells me, well, we don't believe in Jesus. And I had heard that that was the only way to get to heaven. And if you didn't go to heaven, you went to hell. And I was assured that she wasn't going to heaven, that I wasn't going to hell, and that all those little people that didn't know anything about, that didn't have the knowledge of what I was given the knowledge, they weren't going to hell either. So I learned that absolutes were, were not really adhered to, at least, by society. And then I went, you know, I grew up in the Army, was a medic in the Army, and when I got out, I did carpentry and learned some trade. And then I worked at a psychiatric unit at the VA hospital. And then I went into capitalism. And I bought this little bought low sell high as often as possible. Sold and or traded around three hundred million dollars worth of product. And at that point, fifty two years old, two thousand and five, I said, you know, there's got to be more to this. And I went on a what I called a sabbatical for, uh, and I was going to take a couple of years off. And I had been successful enough at capitalism that I could if I lived uh, right and uh, without excessiveness. And so I did that, and I worked with the University of Akron on a polymer science engineering, uh, their polymer science engineering school, to come together with a rapidly deployable housing structure that could be used for permanent settlements. And, not to get into detail on that, but the professors were very interested and they said, hey, if you can get us funding, we think we can build what you're talking about. What I told them was this could revolutionize the housing industry. And they were excited, but way over my head to get funding and deal with all these different institutions and everything was about funding. And so I went back to the drawing board because I realized it didn't, but when we built it, construction houses with an individual understanding both intellectually and that role that are to take care of ourselves and fit into a civil society. I'd rather have a silk sheet between a friend than a concrete wall between neighbors. So it wasn't necessarily about the structure. So I went to the drawing board and said, what can I what question can I ask people to stimulate that empathetic and intellectual understanding of our shared existence? And that came up eventually with, are you better off 
has dignified access to food, water, and shelter. And I knew that to be true mathematically because everybody is, we're all connected. And if one's running out of food, water, shelter, then the other one's in danger of it as well. The possibilities are very, very exciting to me. So what I'm thinking is all humans should be able to have access to life extension technology. So what I would like to see, two things, life extension for all human beings, which would involve subsidizing cryonics, number one, and number two, legal protection for cryonics patients, which would involve a legal program that would enable all cryonics patients to have legal protection for their suspension. So that means, say that there's somebody that wants to get suspended that might not have the money immediately to have the cryonics process that they desire, they would be able to put down a plan um, that would give them that opportunity late, later, um, even if it's something as simple as paying $20 a month on um, something like paying in cryptocurrency. And it's important, I think, to again stress that the Futurist New Deal uh, creates an environment that is highly conducive to getting those 340 million people uh, to survive to a universal longevity escape velocity. Uh, the $52,000 uh, payout, which is uh, uh, quadruple or double uh, the other candidates' payouts, um, is will allow for people to have uh, that much more um, ability uh, to uh, be well, uh, to take care of their families, uh, to plan, and uh, for the, for their own health and the preventative measures that will allow them uh, to uh, to achieve super longevity. It is something that I'm, I'm uh, vaguely familiar with. Is the uh, use of the cyborgs and, and the, the very high-end uh, technical aspects of extending uh, radical life extension. Uh, my, my core, though, goes back to uh, significant life extension, and it starts at birth. Uh, I'm, I'm not just looking for the old guys like me. I'm looking out for those that are born into this world that are not born into an equal set of resources and technologies and science that never reaches them. So we have about 20 million people in the U.S. that are inadequately housed without dignified access to food, water, and shelter on a secure basis. This is actually a really important question for me because culture is one of my main areas and I define as a cultural futurist. Now, I think the way to get reason and science out to culture is to create a culture of reason and science. Now, whether this is through creating music and art with a rational message, whether this is through public education on transhumanism or funding the transgressive arts in a way that makes people aware of science. Our job as transhumanists is to make people aware of science and reason in a way that is accessible to them. Um, this involves decreasing the importance of credentialism by getting people out of the ivory towers and into the media. It involves expanding our entertainment industry uh, but this, the simple fact is um, we're seeing a middle class uh, that is in crisis uh, right now. And uh, it is why um, my campaign is focused on getting us outside of an echo chamber uh, where we're discussing um, uh, far futurist notions and uh, talking to people, um, ordinary Americans, uh, people who may not uh, have a real investment in radical life extension or futurist notions. And some of those people, they're even highly critical of uh, ideas like, uh, like uh, full voting or very critical of, um, of, uh, of a, a basic income at a middle class level. And their criticisms, uh, we have to listen to them. Uh, we, we owe it to ourselves uh, to be having these conversations. I'm not saying that all these other radical life extension and cyborgs aren't important because but, but they're getting funded. They're getting funded by, by billionaires, right? Those, some of them. So it, it, that is advancing quite rapidly and will continue as we advance because those that have self-interest. 
I'm looking to bring together team that recognizes what our issues are, how to approach them, and the willingness to do it together, and the recognition that the least among us are our weakest link. They're also our greatest resource potential. And if, if we give them the basic elements of life, then we're going to be way ahead as individuals. These threats were constantly assessed. What would happen if AI took over the world? Um, and on the other end of things, I was also hanging out with a lot of working class people. And they were just worried about AI taking their jobs. So on one hand, people were worried, what happens if AI takes our jobs? Now, this was like over 10 years ago. And on the other hand, people were like, well, what if bad people get access to AI? And some crazy, you know, psychopath uses AI to kill all of the human race. So over here, I'm listening to concerns about people that are afraid that their jobs are going to be taken away. And over here, I'm listening to people afraid that somebody's going to use a malevolent AI to wipe out the human race. And I'm thinking, you know, like everybody's afraid of something. And that's when I started to think maybe it's not AI itself, but what people are afraid that other people are going to do with AI. Now, maybe the real existential risk is what humanity is going to do with technology. Uh, we know that our world is not without its risks. Um, uh, <laughs> Many, many of these risks are not merely uh, far future concerns about uh, artificial singletons uh, or um, gray goo or uh, mad science run amok. Um, we are already seeing downsides in many ways uh, to automation and advanced algorithms from a contemporary civil rights perspective. It's easy for us to want to overlook these things in the new media landscape because we have benefited tremendously as a society from this network effect and connectivity um, in ways uh, that we don't always want to acknowledge on a daily basis. We are more politically literate as a society. We are more agile. Uh, we have this kind of connectivity and many benefits that come uh, from it. Um, that's given a lot of people a lot of hope, a lot of strength. And um, all of these benefits um, are, are helping us a lot. The existential threats, whether they be, you know, what, what's a cause and, and what is a, a result, but uh, climate change, healthcare, pollution, conventional war, nuclear war, abuse against women and children, and the refugee situation, which is hundreds of millions. And so what do we do about that? What can we, what do we know about that? How much data do we have on each individual and what their needs are? And what do we measure that against? I'm, I'm back to two, two, two. So if, if you have refugees, and I'm going back to that because it, it's very much in the news and it's something that we can help capture uh, the attention of for the Transhumanist Party. Uh, if we have something that, that says it's a solution or, and we identify the cause and, and we use what we know in order to address it collectively.